just like to begin by thanking the organisers very much uh, for this uh, conference um, and uh, the opportunity to speak in it. So in, uh, in line with the theme of the conference, I wanted to consider um, how studies of human, uh, humans and fire can contribute to development of geoarchaeology more widely. And in particular, new high-resolution microcontextual techniques are highlighting the diversity of materials in archaeological sediments that include a rich range of plants and micro-artifacts and their very high precision spatial and temporal relations to each other and time spans. So as such, really, geoarchaeology can contribute to a wide range of interdisciplinary theories in the earth, biological, material and social sciences, as well as the arts and humanities and um, is able to, incre uh, to examine a range of global challenges um, in the past, present and future. Um, and in particular, we can look at context, which is key in understanding archaeology, but also in archaeological theory and linking theory and data. So fires had a major impact um, on the past in the transformation of environments, but also materials and technologies, and also as an energy in socio-political relations. So I wanted to look at one of the major step changes um, in human um, environment interrelations, which is the transition from mobile hunting and gathering to sedentary agriculture, <coughs> um, and, to, and to investigate the links between environment, humans, and other species. So in looking at um, previous studies of um, technology and fire use, Silar and Tite in particular highlight the interrelationship of environment, society, and politics, for example. And all choices are uh, affected by considerations of environment, on my page, I'm afraid, <laughs> I can look down here, Te technological expertise and scales of production, the perceived properties and performance of materials, but we can also look at the biographies of materials, and in recent theories on entanglement, how people, places, and things are all interrelated. So really a choice of fuel in consi consi includes consideration of all of these. And context is key to understanding this because we can look at very specific actions and incidents of fuel. We can look at fuel in particular fields of action, but also how fuel and energy is used across different environments. So previous studies of fuel have shown that um, production and, and selection of fuel vary according to its availability. And a whole range of uh, factors like seasonality and climate affect this as well as land management. The ecological and social strategies, which vary between hunter-gatherers and pastoralists and agriculturalists, but also the particular tasks when fuel is collected and how these are all interrelated. So this paper today is drawing on new energy-centered theories, exploring these in a paper by Clark and Yusuf. They were developing an anthropogenic geologic approach and they were looking at um, a specific studies of energy because study of fire, for example, and energies can enable us to investigate the specific relationships between energy flows, environments, humans, materials, and other species. So it's in this light that actually this is a very broad-ranging review, but I wanted to look at um, drawn theories from a range of different disciplines, because our materials are coming from different disciplines, <coughs> but to look at how fire-related aspects of these can help us interpret the geoarchaeological data uh, more fully. So we can look, for example, at correlations between humans, fire and environment, and the role of, for example, fire and niche construction, or look at fuel and fire ecology and tarscapes, drawing on both on-site and off-site data, as you can see the data highlighted in the far column. In considering how fire affects humans and the phenomenology of it, we can draw on cognitive archaeology to look at the effect of fires on the senses and perception and bringing people together. And looking at the social roles, we can look at where fire is placed and the particular types of activities and those and what is bringing people together, but also access to fire energy and those uh, resources and technologies. We can look at materials and look at technological choices to look at the scale of production, the operational chains. We should also con consider in fire how it has symbolic properties and is an agency and transformation. It can also affect health by changing nutrition of, of plants, for example, and other foodstuffs, but also can impact on living conditions and is also used in fire and conflict. So in studying all of this, context is going to be key in looking at theory and data. <clears throat> so the methodology that I'm drawing on principally is micromorphology, but with integrated archaeobotany and IR to look at uh, impact of burning on materials and GCMS. 
And what I wanted to highlight was that um, experimental studies, for example, by Boardman and Jones, have shown that the charred plants on which many fire studies are based only represent plants burnt at often low temperatures, less than 400 to 500 centigrade. And also the types of plants, um, plant parts, um, burn differently. So, for example, chaff, the carbon's burnt off very quickly. And this becomes very important in semi-arid areas where grass is a major resource and, bur and carbon burns off very quickly. So, in fact, looking in thin sections, we can see a lot more than just charred plants such as wood, but also here, for example, the ashes, the phytoliths and animal dung pellets. So in looking at a broad region across the Near East where I work, we can see that there are higher charred plants in woodlands where there's wood, but once you get into semi-arid regions, this is fuel in a fire installation, charred plants only represent, say, 10% because it's grasses and reeds and they're left as uh, phytoliths or ashes. Same with date palm, for example. So we're drawing on understanding these remains using experimental archaeology and ethnoarchaeology with Dr. Marta Portillo, who's a Marie Curie fellow at Reading, for example, as well as studies by Sarah Elliott. And in looking at the transformations, um, I'm focusing in on the central Zagros um, archaeological project region in the eastern Fertile Crescent and looking at two sites in the highlands, Sheikhabad and Jani, and some sites in the lowlands, Zazi and Bestansur, for example. And um, this uh, is drawing on results also from where Braidwood was working in the 60s and 70s and new projects such as those at Chogogolan by Tübingen. It's drawing on the work of a whole range of people who I wish very much to acknowledge, including the co-directors um, <coughs> Roger Matthews, Kamal Rashid Rahim and Yaakov Mohamedifar, as with support from the AHRC and National Gra Geographic recently, but also a new work on the environment in Iran with the Faculty of Geography Tehran and Drs. Masoudi and Azizi. And in the Central Zagros project, we're drawing on a whole range of interdisciplinary analyses, including PXRF and study of phosphates, but in particular in the study of fire, integrating archaeobotany, zooarchaeology and micromorphology. The initial results from ours and other projects have shown that um, the Zagros was inhabited way back into the Younger Dryas period, and there's very little interruption, which is um, revolutionary um, based on previous studies where very few sites were known from the early Holocene. There's also very evidence of very widespread exchange networks over more than 1,500 kilometers from Turkey right over into Iran. And also extremely complex buildings, all of which were previously unknown, and include uh, the site that I'll, sh I'll show you uh, briefly in the on-site case studies, Best Ansor, 7600 BC, which is larger and earlier than those at Chattelhuit, for example. Fire is a, a central role in these uh, settlements, and ovens are found um, often within sites and buildings. So this complexity and numbers of sites um, is um, surprising because it was previously thought that the Zagros was too cold and dry for human occupation. However, new analyses of the Zerubar core have shown that there's a marked spike in the microcharcoal, which uh, suggests wildfires. And the presence of sites in the region and humans suggests that humans themselves may have been agents in, environment, in changing the environment because fire led to a massive peak in grasses. And it's these grasslands which also supported the legumes, the cereals, the goats, and the sheep that then became domesticated. So when looking at human and fire use, um, there's a concepts of things like fire and the role of niche construction, whether it was intentional or unintentional, we can see here that humans were indeed one of those agents. And to understand that relationship, we're doing a range of cores, new cores, to test uh, human environment interrelations with the Faculty of Geography and looking at independent climate records from speleotherms. We can also turn to on-site data, which gives us the very evidence that we're seeking in human environment interrelations. And in summarising the evidence across a range of transects, we can see that in the highlands, wetlands were more important than the pollen evidence suggests and are key resources in early settlements. Uh, drylands, and it's only really in the uplands that there's evidence of uh, the use of charred wood. And there's little or no wood uh, down in the lowlands. So if we look at fire use with these changing socioeconomic strategies, we can see that there's evidence of uh, conservation of um, trees for uh, timber. They're not burnt as fuel, although we know that there's poplar in the region. 
but also they're not burning nuts. And nuts in the early settlement of hunter-gatherers were a very important dietary resource. And in thin section, we can actually see calcitic remains of ashes, which burn at very high temperatures and uh, are more abundant than we imagined in the archaeological record. When we're finding a lot of nuts, we're also finding them being burnt with animal dung fuel. So there's um, a strong correlation with the, um, there's a transformation in the dependence on nuts to then domesticated cereals. And it's then that the wood, wood of nuts is being burnt and there's far less diversity with a focus on seeds and grasses. So there's this complex relationship between the woods that are being selected according to whether they're focusing on nut trees or cereals. And micromorphology is contributing to understanding the prevalence of that. One of the things we're finding across these sites is very abundant animal dung. And Hesse even suggested that animals were domesticated for their fuel. And we're looking at the ecology and impact of the use of fuel by uh, using uh, trees and shrubs, uh, for example, for their diet, but also uh, grasses and reeds. So dung was a, a widespreadly available once animals were domesticated and certainly enabled the spread of occupation down into the uh, lowlands where there was no wood for fuel and dung was widely used. Looking now um, in the final set of case studies to how fire is used within sites, for example, we can see that the initial early occupation of sites was when fires were used in open communal areas um, of um, people visiting the sites and actually using storage pits with firecracked stones. Through time, however, ovens become increasingly privatised and placed within architecture, within individual households. But one of the problems on previous studies was that there was very little uh, micro-evidence left within building or macro-evidence to look at its um, scale of use because uh, these approaches weren't used. So geoarchaeology applications today can help us begin to understand this transformation in the use of fire from hunter-gatherers to more settled communities. And Katerina Maliol's study of hunter-gatherer fire taphonomy in Tanzania has shown that uh, traces of hunter-gatherer fires, even after only 10 days, can often uh, be um, intensively disturbed and blown away so that there's only tiny fragments of charcoal, for example, that may be left and traces of reddened earth. So if we're looking for hunter-gatherer use, there's, it seems to be that at the very early levels of these sites in applying geoarchaeology, we can see that these traces of fire are indeed very dispersed and are found in um, accumulations of natural sediments. So the charred wood, the burnt aggregates and the bone are very dispersed and suggest very infrequent hunter-gatherer movements. There's a massive change around 8000 BC with much more rapid deposition which suggests more continuous year-round occupation because the preservation is excellent. And this corresponds with the use of dung as fuel. And this intensity of occupation is marked, for example, by the repeated plastering of ovens and their incorporation with houses. So there's an increasing focus on humans um, and fire within buildings. The study of plants and taphonomy and fire use is, is extremely important, particularly in uh, these semi-arid regions, because even down in the lowlands of Iraq, we're finding that there's very little charred wood, and the focus is on vitaliths um, from drylands and wetland resources near springs um, and dung fuel, which is enabling settlement. And there's temporal variation um, showing up as well in the plant materials. So when looking at fire as a transformative agent and how it can actually influence technological choices, with increasing sedentism, there's also increasing um, understanding of materials and manipulation of these, including fire for fired lime, for ceramics, as well as figurines. And applying IR, for example, we've identified that this indeed, these hard surfaces in front of this building, are um, uh, fired lime, which is very heavy fuel consumption. And fire, it's this fired lime surface only occurs in front of this very large building. And indeed, the transformation of this material itself may be marking this building. We know they're using very specific materials for particular um, uses, with green silty clays for roofing, red earths for the mud brick, and quartz-rich and feldspar-rich materials for the fire installations, creating very durable installations which are controlling fire within the settlement and are fire resistant. This particular building turns out to be a potential house of the dead because in fact it's got um, more than 72 burials below the floor. 
There are traces of figurines and scattered beads, bitumen um, cowrie shells which would have been placed within the eyes, as well as extensive matting, and the floors are kept incredibly clean. So fire, however, had a particular role within this building because this installation here had, um, thank you very much, a mace head and an upturned stone on it, traces of human bone, as well as a large wing bird bone, which is often used in ritual paraphernalia. Within this fire, these, all of these ashes, there's very little charred plant materials. It's um, these, as I showed earlier, phytoliths um, being burnt at very high temperatures with melted silica. Given that a lot of the burials and the floors are covered in matting, it's conceivable that this was ritual burning of all of these um, burials, uh, burial materials, um, because these are found around the uh, human remains, for example. And there's um, uh, many more burials yet to be found within this building. There's evidence of the use of red pigment, for example, on wall paintings, but also in um, ashes. One of the things we're finding a lot of is um, uh, shaped fragments of clay, which are sub-millimeter or just um, up to two to five millimeters, and these have been very lightly burned. And um, these seem to be perhaps parts of um, small shaped objects, such as figurines, which we're finding at just less than a centimeter or more. And studies of um, ritual and the transformation of uh, materials suggest that figurines are often used in things like wish magic and placed in fires, for example. And it's these that we're finding, these very low fragments of figurines in fires, as well as, um, as, well as more broken up traces of them. So the last uh, f um, thing I wanted to look at was fire use and health within these built environments. We found that um, there is indeed a, a huge impact on the inter interior environment, with traces of soot on uh, multiple uh, replasterings at sites like Shimshara. <laughs> and these correspond with those at Chattelhuyuk, where there seems to be evidence of at least 70 major annual plasterings and seasonal replasterings with increasing soot towards the end of each sequence, suggesting this may be the um, spring and this may indeed be the winter months. And certainly we've also found seasonal use of fires at Chattelhuyuk on the roofs, collapsed roofing materials, where there's traces of oven rakeout and then water laid deposits and then oven rakeout. So fires are very much a focus of these um, settlements and there's evidence also of use of fire as destructive force. Um, here, this uh, in intense conflagrations on this early Neolithic site with the stone artifacts melted in several um, destructive fires that swept across the settlement. So wildfires would have increased because of the grasslands, the increasing drying environment, but also with humans living much closer together. But also there was increasing inequalities and in control over materials, so fire may have been used speculatively as destructive force. And we, fire forensic investigations can be applied. So in this rapid run-through, I just wanted to highlight that um, by tracing fire, for example, we can see, and using geoarchaeology, we can see that... Um, Geoarchaeology is enabling identification of a much diverser range of fire-affected plants and dung and taphonomy than previous studies of flotation alone, and uh, also helping to interpret pollen sequences. We can actually look at a range of um, interdisciplinary theories in the study of these, from human uh, environments such as niche, niche construction, but also in social relations. And studying energy can actually enable us to trace fire in environment, um, socioeconomic strategies, how it's used in technology and culture and health. And in looking at the choices of fuels, there's clearly more wood fuel in highlands and nut trees are initially conserved and dung is widely used by agricultural societies, enabled them to become more sedentary. They're creating um, heat-resistant and radiant um, installations for sort of economic uses of fire and creating a range of durable materials by firing clay and lime. They're also increasingly enclosing it and privatising it, as well as um, speculatively using it in ritual, for example, of burning of materials. So in conclusion, I think we can study very particular materials and trace them through environment and society and apply a range of approaches um, to look at them and these are some of the theories and some of the more detailed data that I was looking at. So thank you. Sorry for the speech.